I realize I don't even know if there are gallery announcements that Molly or Demi or Amanda, if you want to make any about what's what's up and what's coming up. Um, yes, so this is the last week for our current shows. Um, and we are appointment only at this time. And, and at this time, all, all the appointments are, uh, most of the appointments are booked. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to get in and see the work. If not, they, uh, all the images are available on screens in the front window. Um, and that's something we will do going forward. So every exhibition, you'll be able to see the images even if the doors are closed or you come by on a, you know, on a day that we're not physically open or you can't get in. So please um, come by to see those in the window. Um, and so we will be installing a new show next week that will open uh, on Thursday. And um, we have the work of John Henry and the work of Wendell White that will be on view for February and March. At this time, we are doing two month exhibitions, um, basically through through April, through April. Um, and that just gives us more time to get in as we continue to adjust to uh, limits, you know, social distancing and limitations and such. So, um, and we will have artist talks for each of those artists, one in February, on February 10th and one on March 3rd. So say somebody was excited about the new exhibitions that are going to be opening. Yeah. How would I get an appointment to go see those? Yes, very good. So you can go right to our website. Thank you. And actually on the top of the website, there is a, there's a link you can go to um, and it will take you right to the appointments um, calendar. And you can go right now and book through um, appointments through February right now. Um, we also have a great diversity show that is um, kind of a visiting exhibition, um, kind of outside uh, curated, and that's in our library on the wall, kind of our community wall in the library, and that's on view through February. So you can uh, make an appointment to see that as well, as well as our drawers um, that continue to be available for looking and browsing through, let's see, those, the current 2020 drawers will be available through April, I believe. Is that right, Zemi, or, or March? At least through March. End of March. End of or mid-March, usually, yeah. yeah. Um, the process is ongoing right now for the jurying for the next round of drawers. And to be clear, these are drawers that you pull out and are yeah. full of photographs. They are, we're not offering to show anybody's underpants. Yeah, no, no drawers, but yeah, these drawers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and of course, the Nine Gallery as well is also available for, for viewing. So, so please... And you can see all the work online as well too for the, for the exhibitions. And even the diversity show, there's a couple of great links to videos on the website, on our website. So um, interviews with some of the artists and uh, their stories. So please, please enjoy. <clears throat> well, and I will welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Lois Levine. I think uh, many of you are returnees to these online events, but there are a few folks I think who might be new. So welcome all. Um, and thank you to the Blue Sky folks, uh, Molly and Amanda and Zemi for always letting me do these fantastic programs. Um, I will say uh, official business, this is being recorded and it will be archived and available um, through Blue Sky. So please know that, that it's being recorded. And if you don't wanna be recorded, just don't speak up. Um, and these are really interactive. So there are two ways uh, to share your thoughts as we go. Um, one is to use the chat when you're chatting. If you wanted to reach everybody, make sure that you choose everyone. Um, and also that we use the raise hand feature, not the actual physical raising of a hand. Um, but if you go down into your, on my screen, it's at the bottom of the screen. There's a bar that pops up. It says participants. If I click on that, I can find myself in the participant list and raise my hand. And that's really helpful because we can't actually scan the screen and see everybody at once. Um, and uh, Amanda is always very helpful for with me and trying to figure out who's been who's waiting to speak. And these are usually we have a lot of a lot of uh, input from everyone, which has been fantastic. Even before COVID. I was leading programs at Blue Sky in the gallery, often pairing uh, poetry with the photographs that were on the wall as a way to bring in more voices and also a way 
to get folks not just to come into the gallery and see the work, but to use what was on the walls or what poetry we were pairing with what was on the walls as a way to forge connection and conversation together. Uh, this is what I love to do, forging community as we are building our understanding together. So the questions I will ask you tonight are not ones that have right answers. The idea is that we're all building meaning together and that what each of you might observe about photographs or um, poems are different than what I might observe. And so we are all looking differently because of what we share with each other. Uh, and the title of the exhibition that we're talking about is Women of the African Diaspora. And there are three photographers who are featured. I'm not sure if we'll get to all three of them tonight, but we will try. Um, and, you know, diaspora is about a dispersal of people from a place. And I think when we think about the African diaspora in particular, as I mentioned at the beginning of the last session, when we looked at uh, some other work from these exhibitions, this is a diaspora that is centuries long and is also continuing right now. And it's really important that it began as a forced diaspora, but has also been a diaspora of choice with people moving not just from Africa to other places, but people of the African diaspora moving from the Caribbean to the US, from the US to the Caribbean, around North America to South America, to Europe and back and all over the world. Um, and for this particular session, I posed the question, uh, does diaspora, this kind of dispersal of people from their original homeland, distance people from their culture and their identity, or does it provide them a precious chance to create culture and identity anew? And also ask the question, since we are talking about photographs, what is the difference between photographs that document culture and identity and photographs that celebrate culture and identity. So those are kind of our meta questions and we'll see how we get to them. And I'm also always interested in the question of what responses, whether they're emotional, cognitive, do we have from particular photographs or poems and what about those things evoke those responses in us? So we're gonna jump right in and usually we start with the photograph, but we're gonna start with a poem because I feel like America has been talking about a poem for the past week in a way that I have not remembered America ever talking about a poem in my lifetime before. So I thought maybe we would start with that poem and uh, I'm gonna do some quick screen sharing. Is the poem appearing? Yes, okay. Um, and. I will read it. it. It's a little too long to all fit on the screen at once. So there'll be a bit of scrolling, but I invite you to read it along with me since you're all on mute and it's really fun. This is a, this is a great poem for people who love the musicality of poetry. The hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade, We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours. Before we knew it, somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, 
the hill we climb, if only we dare. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we're left with. Every breath from my bronze pounded chest will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept Northeast. We will rise where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South we will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. In every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day becomes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Well, that's quite a poem. That's quite a set of images. And maybe the best way to start is um, if folks have a particular image or line or set of lines that sticks with you, what, what do you remember from the poem as I've read it, or perhaps as it was much better read by Amanda Gorman at the inauguration a week ago? Um, but what strikes you from the poem? And remember the chat or the, um, Raise hands feature. Amanda, is anybody bravely starting us off? Oh, not quite. Oh, Molly Nugar, I'd like to start us off. <laughs> um, so I would say not. I mean, there's so ma there's so many great lines, um, and of course, I think many of us have been mulling over many of them over the past week. Um, but I was thinking more about kind of the feelings that I had, um, not so much the feelings, but what I felt this conveyed in terms of a uh, um, of what I would kind of say like a call to arms. But I I feel like it was a the poem in the many many different um, images that are created. Um, it's at once reflective. It's at once so truthful. Um, it is a kind of call to arms and it's also very aspirational, um, which I think is a good thing. Like we need, we need that. Um, we need to, to reflect on the things that um, have come before us, but also aspire to, to the change. Um, and I think so many of these these words that come together, these phrases convey that so, so well to me. Um, that is something I think we'll, we'll look back to um, periodically throughout these next several years. Yeah, and Madeline, or Madeline has put it in the chat. And I, I have to call you by whatever name Zoom thinks you are. So if somebody else in your household was last using your Zoom account, make sure you, you change or answer to their name. So Madeline put in the chat that, that this poem is about, it, it, it references and accepts our history long and recent in a way that is about culpability 
and shows a way of hope and healing. And I think that that is really one of the, the masterful things here. And it's also interesting to me to think about, I, I love language and the different allusions in this poem. So I see allusions to other works of uh, poetry, right? Still we rise, still we rise. Um, but also, and, and Eugenia says rising like a phoenix from the ashes. So there's a, a larger reference there, um, but also, you know, things that people were chanting in the streets here in Portland about justice and what just is. Um, to see that language brought into an inaugural poem was really amazing. Are there other images? And I can kind of, I feel like I get to decide which part of the poem we're looking at just by chance, but uh, other particular images or particular lines that engaged you emotionally? Let's hear from Nancy Henning. Hi, um, I really liked how she inserted herself into the poem just a little bit too. I just loved her lines about being a skinny black girl raised by a single mom and descendant of slaves. And now here I am reading you know, this poem and hoping to be president someday. I just loved that too. Like, I didn't feel like it was, um, self-centered or you know what I mean I just loved how she put her own story into this poem like she's just a, a cog in this big country we call America that's a work in progress and I don't know like I think it's so aspirational too like just like we were talking about the whole the whole poem itself but her own story yeah it's kind of masterful to put yourself in the middle of this poem and not come across as as anything but humbled by this reality. Like we say anybody can be president and it hasn't really been true. And mm. now it's more maybe a little bit true, but also that her very presence is part of this, of making true what we have been voicing in our ideals, but not living in our reality. Um, and uh, people in the talking in the chat about the rhythms, right? This is a really rhythmic poem and it definitely comes out of rap as reference, but I think it comes out of a, an oral tradition that is has lots of antecedents in African-American culture and literature, right? So I think about it also in terms of uh, preaching as well as rap and, and just being in a culture where there's an emphasis on oral prowess um, and the, duality of words, right? So there are rhymes, but there are also near rhymes, grieved and grew, hurt and hope. Claire called those out in the chat. Um, other, are other folks waiting with hands up, Amanda? No. All right. I'm gonna take us onto a photograph. It's always interesting to me whether people are ready to jump in more with a photograph than with uh, a poem. But um, if people are not, let, well, let's go on to a, to an image. So I'm going to switch over. How do I, I do that? I, oh, I just stopped screen sharing. This is, I'm figuring it all out. We've never gone from a PDF to a slide before in our refocusing time. All right, here we are. Um, so this poem is called Olivia Looking. It's by Jasmine Clark. It's one of the ones that's up in the gallery right now. Take a moment and look hard at this photograph. Try and memorize every detail of it that you can. And really think about the effects of each of those details. I've done something that made the chat go away. Now I can't see the chat anymore. So I'm slightly freaking out while I do this. Hmm. Amanda, I don't, I can't figure out how to make my chat come back. Um, if you click on the very bottom bar, oh, since you're sharing your screen, can you see right. the bar? 
No. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll message you and see if it pops up. Oh, I like that. Amanda's so clever. Okay, so meanwhile, since I've taken the picture away, I told you to memorize everything you could about it. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Um, what do you remember about that picture that you were just looking at so intently? Tell us something that you recall. Looks like Yu Yang has a hand up. So there's one detail that I remember from the image um, was that the horizon, horizon between the ocean and the sky, is right at the eye level of the of the of the of the of the subject. That's like one detail I remember remember very clearly. Okay. Other things that people are recalling. Uh, let's hear from Cynthia Kirk. Hi, Cynthia, and then Poncho after that. Sorry, I'm trying to. Uh, it's, it's it's great to be here. I'm actually I'm actually in Portland, which is exciting. <laughs> um, what I remember, I mean, I I agree about the horizon. Um, there's this sense of kind of calm determination. She's turned away from us. And she's very young. Her shoulders are so thin. She's a little girl. So the sm- the smallness of her, the f- the the thinness of her whole body. But I like that you said determination. That you mm-hmm. you're sort of associating um, an emotion or a character trait with her. Yes, I think it's because she's turned away from us, mm-hmm. and her braids are a statement, not, and not just the braids themselves, but the decoration as well, the beads. Yeah, thank you. And is, I think Pancho's up next. Yes, and then uh, Madeline, we'll hear from Madeline after that. So the first thought that came to me was this is either an African girl standing on the shore in Africa looking across the ocean to the place where all her ancestors were taken away, or an African-American girl on the shore someplace in the United States, looking back across the ocean to where her ancestors came from and feeling this sense, in both cases, feeling this sense of distance. Yeah, there's something about, particularly about a black body and a black child's body against ocean because of what a tra- what tr- the transatlantic forced migration has been and that sense of longing. I mean, I think we feel longing whenever we see anybody looking at a, sh- at a shoreline, but it's definitely laden with a more disturbing history and, a, and that deepens a kind of longing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so Madeline and then um, is Chris next? Uh, actually, Molly Major will be next. Oh, unless she took her hand down and then Chris after that. Okay. <laughs> it took Mad- Madeline, make sure you unmute. Thank you. Um, sh- what I was thinking is she is not facing, her body is not facing the water, her face is, but her body is facing to the right of the frame. So she's actually turning and we're seeing her Someone mentioned before how small her arms were. How we're seeing a very small part of her body, actually. We're not seeing the breadth of her back. So we're seeing her even smaller. And for me, her shoulders looked rounded. It wasn't a hopeful picture. It was um, not this joy. And the muted colors of the sky added to that sort of very gray in feeling of a very toned down feeling. And she's not quite, she's not quite turned towards the water, as I said, she's facing it, but she's not fully facing it. She's as much not facing us as whatever it is that she is facing. Correct, correct. I might bring the picture back because I love it so much while we continue talking, but um, is, so is, is Molly Major next? No, Molly is not. I took down, I took down my hand. Okay. So um, my, my feeling about this is colored by the fact that last night I saw this movie Scales by a uh, uh, Saudi 
female director. It's the it's the Saudi Arabia's nominee for best foreign picture to the Academy Awards, and it's it's about in the in the movie it's about a young girl trying to deal with the idea that that she's becoming a woman and that, that that's completely completely different. And the C is this in the in the con director's construction. The C is the symbol of of womanhood and sort of facing facing that or not facing it and trying to remain a child. Um, so for me, there's there's this aspect of sort of looking forward into into time and the possibilities, which I didn't have that association with this picture before yesterday. So. So. Oh, that's really interesting. You've seen this picture plenty before yesterday. So I just want to call out some things that, that have come up. One is the sense of a, a very specific and literal relationship to ocean that uh, Pancho was talking about versus a metaphorical kind of sense of ocean or open water that Chris is talking about. The, and the fact is we actually have no idea who this, where this person is, right? She could be in Australia looking at the Pacific. I don't, I don't know what the shore of Australia looks like. I'm assuming that could be true. Um, and, and also this, uh, the things that people have said about her body, she's not facing us, but she's not quite facing the water either. This sense of the smallness of her body, even though she is very large in the frame, we still understand the smallness of her body. Um, we've had uh, some comments and also some comments in the chat about the colors, the way that the yellow and green versus the color of the water and the color of the sky. The comment Yu Yang started us with is, what does it mean that horizon is exactly at what we expect as her eye level? Which is such a fascinating connection to make since we can't see her face, but we're looking at exactly what she is looking at. Um, and Eugenia also added uh, the vastness in, the, in what is surrounding her. Um, are there other folks who are waiting, Amanda? Yes, Molly Newgard's next. And then Chuck Barnes after that. Okay. So I think the title is interesting in that it's sort of reinforcing much of what people have said. I mean, she chooses the title as Olivia looking. Um, so is it, you know, exactly where, what is she looking at? And it makes me think about the tilt the tilt of her head, like where is her gaze actually? Mm -hmm. um, and so is it kind of a contemplative look um, like this, this literal or this metaphorical, but it's, it's a focus on looking, uh, whether we are looking at Olivia or Olivia, Olivia's looking, looking out to something. Um, I, yeah, so that, that struck me as I, I took time to notice the title as everyone was talking and it, it um, sort of reinforced what people were saying. Yeah, it is a great title because of the question of Olivia doing the looking versus our looking at Olivia. But I hadn't thought about this slight, what appears to be a slight tilt of her head until you said that, which, which I feel like makes me want to put even more narrative into this photograph. I think a lot of us want to put narrative into what's going on. Um, is Chuck Barnes next? Yes. I think it's interesting uh, I don't think anyone said this before, that we don't see the shore at all, right? We see her and the ocean. We don't see any evidence of shore. We, we assume she's standing on something. We also don't know how far she is from the water. From the size of the waves, it looks like she could be actually fairly high up. It's sort of this interesting sort of non-specificity about her immediate relation to the, to the uh, ocean itself, right? Oh, you're right. I, I totally want to put her on land looking out at water, but we don't know that that's true. She could be on a seafaring craft. Um, but right, we don't actually know. We've, we have more information about where she is in relationship to horizon than where she is in relationship to water. I'm trying to think about whether that makes sense, what I just said. That is to say, we can't see the distance, as, as you put it. Um, so what's the effect of that then? To me personally, it makes it a more sort of spiritual image of just the, you know, sea and sky and her being a part of that. She's, it seems she's, she's, 
part of her, if we look at the picture, the image of her, part of her, her is in the sky and part of her is, is in the sea. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm looking at some of the comments that are coming up in the chat. People are talking about this vastness, but also softness, as Yu Yang has pointed out, because of the focus, the water and the sky is soft. And it contributes to that sense that Chuck brought up of us not really un being able to judge where she is in relationship to the water. It sort of compounds that. Um, and I also like that somebody, uh, Wendy pointed out that she could be a, she could be a skinny black girl who might one day be president or read for a president. Um, thank you for connecting it to the poem that I wasn't sure I was connecting it to well enough. Um, who's, who else is waiting, Amanda? Uh, Claire Stock and then Chris Rauschenberg after that. Okay, um, I don't know whether anybody's said this before, but um, you know, when I look at this, she's facing west, and she's um, in uh, Ghana, and it's sort of like, what's this next generation going to? Um, what's going to be her history going forward? So she's looking into the future, and I really sort of project all of that onto her. It's very easy for me to, you know hear that story when I, when I see this image. Yeah, I mean, this question has come up, I think, in a, a lot of the salons that we've had about the extent to which we are creating or feel, feel des the desire to create narratives about what's happening before and after the picture where we really only have the, um, the during the moment of the, of the photograph. And it's also interesting to think about how we want to read, I mean, what does a t-shirt even convey when we're trying to locate somebody geographically at this point in time? Like that is a kind of clothing that has become ubiquitous and is probably also a product of a global trade, right? Where, if it's cotton, where was that cotton produced? Where, where was the cotton grown? Where was the shirt produced? How does it end up belonging to this particular person? And similarly to with the beads in her hair, right? These are, um, if they're speaking to a tradition, they're also, plastic beads that have become ubiquitous in our global economy. Uh, I think Chris is next and then Nancy, is that right? Yes. Yeah, Madeline in the chat referred to her being literally not grounded. And I think that's part of the, my emotional reaction to the picture too, is I, I sort of feel, I didn't put it into words, but I sort of feel like she's having, she's in a position of having to write her own future. Without, without having the benefit of ground to stand on. There's, there's sort of possibility, but no, no there's no um, uh, scaffolding. There's, no, there's nothing there for her to kind of uh, launch from other than whatever she can find within herself. So for you, it's a having to, as opposed to getting to writing her own future, having to write her own future, as opposed to getting to write her own future. The, well, possibility versus yeah. or without, as you said, the clear support or the clear grounding, at least not clear to us. Yeah, I think it's both. And I, it relates back to your sort of initial question that you threw out, uh, you know, of like, what is the role of tradition and, and you know, ha having to decide what you want your life to be and getting to decide what you want your life to be are, um, to you know, the glass is half full and half empty, you know, and uh, and you know, having like I say, having seen this movie last night about how um, it posits a society where a woman doesn't have any choice about what her future is, um, that's not very tempting. So, getting to is is maybe uh, is maybe kind of the key point, but but the fact that she's so young makes it puts the having to aspect of it as well. Yeah, I think there is something inherently, we, we prefer to see children <laughs> with adults around them that we feel are protective and positive forces. Uh, Nancy, I think you're up. Uh, well, the, the first thing and the thing that sticks with me the most about this picture, and maybe it's so obvious, is just how she's the, the color. She's the warmth. She's surrounded by just darkness and gray it just looks like an Oregon coast picture to me you know it's like it's just muted cultness and then there, she's got those beautiful beads in her hair and that 
yellow and the tone of her skin like she's the warmth she's the sun in this picture yeah by far the warmest color in here is actually olivia's skin and mm. then the probably the next warmest color are the beads that are adorning her hair even the color of her shirt is is kind of muted but it it enhances her occupying the center of the photo that she's also as you said the, the color against this um I was going to say very bland, but we could just call it very Oregon background. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like one of the questions I had on my list of things for us to talk about with this photograph is, is this about diaspora? And I think we, we've touched on that some, but, um, but if people have other thoughts about this question of uh, diaspora, and also the other question that I said about, that I started us off with about like, you know, are these What's the difference between a photograph that is documenting culture or identity and a photograph that's celebrating culture or identity? So questions of diaspora, questions of documentation versus celebrating in terms of this photograph. Um, do folks have more thoughts? Let's hear from you, Yan. Um, just <clears throat> regarding to diaspora and also this photo, um, I think I can, I have a lot of personal experiences relating to the subjects. So looking at the horizon, um, at the ocean, I've done that a lot of times at the Oregon coast, whenever I go to Oregon coast, because you know, once you pass Japan, you can just pass Japan. The other side of this ocean is my home country. And um, uh, I, due to a lot of reasons, I cannot go back and then, you know, just reunite with my family. But, you know, sometimes this act of looking, it's, it's uh, one of the only ways I can, you know, look over some of the reality that I'm dealing with right now. And then just looking for some, some like hope for future as someone put in the chat about hope um about a a a, a better future for me and um uh regarding to diaspora um i think i think uh, i think uh, louise your question was about uh what was about the uh, culture identity and uh, and and something like that right yeah um you want me to answer if, if, regarding if, to that, if you feel like it, sure. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can. Yeah, I can. I, I can speak to it. Um, uh, I mean, to me, I feel like um, whether you should be creating a new identity or you should be maintaining on the and 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 the and the preserve your identity. I I think from my personal experience, it's a balancing act. It's a very balancing mm, um, balancing act between how much you should retain of your top, retain the cultural identity from where you come from and how much you need to you need to give up in order to um, uh, submerge yourself in this new uh, mainstream society yeah that's yeah that that's that that's my thought on the diaspora and um, just from my personal experience and also just you know relating to the photos and um, as this um, girl um, looking over the horizon. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I appreciate that your comment about standing at the Oregon coast and looking uh, west brings us back to that way that that ocean is both a literal and metaphorical, right, in your experience, and that your experience of diaspora is being in the first generation of it, whereas we don't know Olivia's family history and how how long African diaspora might, how many generations of African diaspora her family may have experienced um, so that that also complicates things. And I also realized that in some ways that question about um, that there's a way in which I make it sound like in my, the question I posed about culture and identity makes it sound like in that place that people have come from, culture and identity are frozen in time, which of course also is not true, right? <laughs> that um, whether we're talking about Africa or any other place, it is evolving at the same time that the people who have dispersed from that place or been dispersed from that place are also encountering other cultures. There are new cultural encounters happening everywhere all the time. 
Um, Amanda, is anybody else waiting to say something? No, not at the moment. Okay. Um, we've done such a rich job with this photograph that I'll sort of say, go in once, go in twice. Any other thoughts before we move on? I think actually there have been a couple of new people who have joined the meeting since we began, so they might not know how to raise their hand and that would be found in the reactions um, button on the bottom bar of your window here in the Zoom. Just so if you go back, if you go down to the bottom of the, whatever your Zoom screen is, I think this is true for all devices, but I might be telling a lie, um, then it will give you a chance to under reactions, raise your hand and then we can call on you and you can also use the chat if you prefer that. Um, all right, so next up we have another poem. Sorry, I think, oh, Evan Schneider, he raised his hand right when we were talking about that. Okay, Evan Schneider, tell us what you have to say, please. But you have to unmute yourself. We refuse to listen unless you unmute yourself. Am I I'm un unmuted now? Yes. Yeah, um, it reminded me of the last two lines of the poem. Oh. Of uh, you're brave enough to see it and brave enough to be it. She obviously is seeing it, but I think there's this dilemma that I what that evokes, you know, the picture evokes for me is there's um, some trepidation about what's going to happen. And being it is not as easy as it may seem to be. Yeah, I just want to, I, I want those shoulders a little broader or a little less, but she's also a little kid, so maybe I shouldn't put too much on her shoulders. Just yeah. <laughs> um, it looks like Jim also has a hand up now. Yeah. Um, what you know, I see and I'm projecting is uh, I see a, a, a young woman in that liminal space that uh, refugees and genocide su survivors and people that have been involved in diaspora find themselves. And that's, you know, not knowing where we fit. And, and, uh, and, and often there's uh, the question, because when people come to a new country, they're often othered and outsiders and they either have to maintain their own identity, but they also wanna be accepted. So there's the, the question of, do I become more like my schoolmates, my classmates, do I dress like them? Um, I might not even speak English very well. And so, so to me, I'm seeing that young woman in that place of where do I fit in? Yeah. And she's also, she's young. I mean, I feel like young woman is even older than I would label her well, from okay. what we can see, right? We, we can say girl. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, um, so one of the things we haven't talked about is her amazing braids. Like there is somebody who cares a lot about making those braids as um, beautiful and symmetrical as they are. And that also, so we are seeing this child uh, alone, but there's the implication of uh, other hands that, that touch and care for this child in those braids. And I just wanted to call that out. Um, all right, I'm gonna take us to our next poem. I have to move things around on my screen so that I can actually see the poem to read it to you. Um, this poem is by the wonderful Gwendolyn Brooks, one of my favorite poets. I am a black, Kojo. According to my teachers, I am now an African-American. They call me out of my name. Black is an open umbrella. I am a black and a black forever. I am one of the blacks. We are here, we are there, we occur in Brazil, in Nigeria, Ghana, in Botswana, Tanzania, in Kenya, in Russia, Australia, in Haiti, Soweto, in Grenada, in Cuba, in Panama, Libya, in England, in Italy, France. We are graces in any places. I am black and a black forever. I am other than hyphenation. I say proudly, my people. I say proudly, our people. Our people do not disdain to eat yams or melons or grits or to put peanut butter in stew. I am Kojo. In West Africa, 
Kojo means unconquerable. My parents named me the seventh day from my birth in black spirit, black faith, black communion. I am Kojo, I am a black, and I capitalize my name. Do not call me out of my name. Um, so this is a poem that is all about the speaker of the poem. And I'm curious about what you think about the speaker of this poem. Like wh what, what's your response to what we're being told by Kojo and to the way that Gwendolyn Brooks is using Kojo to tell us something? Chris Rauschenberg, start us off. Yeah, in, in our uh, EC meeting, we were looking at a video that was submitted to us that, that was largely about all the bad connotations that go with the word black and all the good connotations that go with the word white, you know, black magic and white magic, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it was kind of making the point that like, why are you calling me all these bad things? And, when we were discussing, we said, "Well, actually, I don't think, I don't think black is a is a is a name that was put onto somebody." Here, this word means bad, so you're bad, so you get it. I felt like it was something that came from like this is what I call myself, as this poem says, and uh, I I don't don't call me Negro or any of these other things that you used to call me. I I want to be this more powerful name, black. So. There is a long history of lightness and whiteness being coded as positive and blackness and darkness being coded as negative in our language, right? If you think about the enlightenment, right? Versus benighted. Um, but there is also the specific claiming of black as a term. And it's interesting here because in Brooks's poem, it's not black in the, I was trying to remember in what documentary just Chuck D and just jump right in if you've seen this documentary, Chuck D talks about the different titles that were applied to him when he was born versus when he enrolled in school, when, you know, was enrolled in like kindergarten or first grade versus when he graduated from high school and the evolution from, I think maybe colored to Negro to black. Um, but I'm not sure that I'm getting that right. Uh, but the, the contrast here is between black and African-American, which is a different contrast than saying Negro or colored feels antiquated. It's according to my teachers, I am now African-American. I don't, that's not the identity that I want. I don't want this new term put on me, which I think complicates some of that. Um, I see, is Pancho the next one to speak and then Claire, have I got it right, Amanda? Yes, you do, thank you. So I was going to say something similar to what you just said, Lois. Um, to me, the interesting line is, I am other than hyphenation. She is rejecting the term African American because it refers to only a specific group of Black people, Black Americans. Whereas what she's, she's making a pan-African argument in the poem saying that all black people are connected and that black is a better term than African-American because black encompasses not only black people in the United States, black, but black people in the Caribbean, black people in Africa, black people in South America, wherever, wherever, wherever. So it's a much more um, expansive view and term than the hyphenated term African-American. We are here, we are there, right? We, I, I feel like I want to suce it and say we are everywhere, but that's exactly what she does, both in the specificity of places like Russia. I have to say, everything I know about Black people in Russia comes from having seen an exhi exhibition of photographs of the Black population in Russia. But uh, Well, remember that Pushkin, the greatest Russian poet, was Black. <laughs> 
you would not let me forget the poncho. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right, but so that her, that, but that to say we are here, we are there, we are everywhere would have been, I think, would have packed less punch than what she does instead, which is we occur in Brazil, in Nigeria, Ghana, in Botswana, in Tanzania, in Kenya, right? This catalog, which for those of you who know uh, the European tradition, certainly of poetry, the cataloging is an important part of epic poetry. And she's creating this catalog of presence going on. Now I can't remember who's supposed to go next. Is it Claire? Oh yeah, I was going to say exactly what Poncho said, that it really, this um, poem really takes us outside of the United States, like she's coming in. I mean, I don't really hear, like I think about Nina Simone, I'm black and I'm proud. And that's really American, I feel like that's really American. And for some reason that the poem here, it, it seems African to me and, um, and very, you know, part of the other continent. I think that, you know, here in the United States, there is a strong uh, desire to connect with the African culture and heritage, but I, she seems so strongly based from the continent, from Africa. And it's really interesting. I mean, because the speaker in this poem is Kojo, but the writer of this poem is Gwendolyn Brooks, right? A, a, a not at all African sounding name, a very much a black American sounding name. Um, and I think of her as no insult intended, an African American poet in the sense that so much of her poetry, you know, she's from the US and so much of her poetry is rooted in the experience of being black in America. But this poem as you can imagine, when I was thinking about what poems to bring in for women of the African diaspora, although Kojo, uh, I think is probably not female, I definitely wanted this for our diasporic poem possibility. Um, are there other thoughts people have about the poem? And you know, visually, because I know some of you are here for the photography more than the poetry and that's okay. But visually, for those of you who are visual people, look at how the poem, obviously I've had to put it into two columns to fit it on one slide, but how the poem works visually in terms of capitalization um, and line breaks and stanza breaks. Are there thoughts that we have about how that's building some of the meaning in the poem? Claire mentioned that it, it gives it a beat, right? The po poetry is, well, I should, good poetry in my mind, the poetry I like is tends to be very rhythmic and very um, rhythmic in terms of stress and also in terms of sound repetition. And this also adds a kind of um, a visual rhythm to it on the page for sure. Let's hear from Pancho. Uh, I just wanted to say one other thing. Um, I find the third line of the poem really interesting. According to my teachers, I am now African American. They call me out of my name. To call somebody out of their name is like the biggest insult there is. And so she's saying that her teachers who are now calling her African-American are insulting her and doing this really negative thing. And she's really pissed off about it. Which is interesting too, because Kojo is a specific name, right? It is a proper noun name, um, but black then takes on that same function here, right? If your failure to call me black is to call me out of my name, then Blackness is not, it is a personal and individual proper identity as well as a larger racial or group or ethnic identity. 
Yeah, but in the next line, it's interesting that she says black, all caps, is an open umbrella, meaning it's taking in everybody. And the implication there is that African-American is not an open umbrella and it is much more um, closed off and limiting. Other folks have thoughts? Uh, yeah, let's hear from Claire Stock. Sorry, I seem to be talking an awful lot. But, you know, I, on the flip side of what I just said, I can't help but think that, you know, I'm a white person. And I really don't know what it's like to um, live the history of a Black person totally. And this, you know, maybe it is uh, an uh, African American. Uh, a black person living in America and, and whose heritage is American. And, but she's exploring, you know, the full um, intensity of her life and her race and her culture. Yeah, I mean, I think this person, if you're being called African-American, I'm guessing that you are not in Botswana, Australia, Panama. Um, but that it's um, that it's an important claim to identity, and that it's also like I, I, this is an interesting poem. And somebody asked when it was written, and I wish I knew the answer to that. I I totally did not write it down. Um, but uh, but that we're in an interesting moment because one of the things that happened in twenty twenty um, is that. All these places, the New York Times is one of them, started capitalizing the word black when it refers to people, which they had not necessarily been doing. And that uh, in a direct response to the kind of conversations that started after the murder of George Floyd. So it's also interesting to think about this poem echoing differently for us in 2020 than it, or 2020, we're in 2021 now, Lois, in 2021 than it would have even at the moment that, um, that Gwendolyn Brooks wrote it, which is, I'm guessing, earlier in terms of when African Americans started to become, started to regain currency in the late 20th century. Um, Let's hear from Madeline next. Okay. Well, we gotta unmute you first. Yeah, um, I grew up in, in New York and um, spent a lot of time in Midtown Manhattan and near the UN. And when African-American became a popular expression, it's suddenly, okay, that's, we're trying to be allies. We're trying to be sensitive as white people. But then you go by the UN and it's like, what are we calling these people? They're not American. You're seeing people from all over the world, all these Africans, and suddenly there was no word to use. So you can't use the word African because you don't know where people are from. And you can't use African-American certainly because they're not American. So what right term did we have? And it was really a conundrum for those of us who wanted to think of the right word without insulting anyone. And I think that, that this poem is also a reminder that it's more than just names and it's more than just labels, right? Black is an open umbrella. So what, what exactly does that mean? We are graces in any places, starts to tell me more about that association. I say proudly, my people. I say proudly, our people. Whenever the poet re does repetition with variation, they're trying to tell you something big is going on. I say proudly, my people. I say proudly, our people. And then this great line, our people do not disdain to eat yams or melons or grits or to put peanut butter in stew, right? This idea of um, a richness of culture that gets measured in particular ways. And then in naming, I am Kojo, my parents named me the seventh day from my birth. So that is a cultural naming practice. I am from a tradition that also has cultural naming practices. Um, so thinking about black spirit, black faith, black communion, that there is something, not just a specificity of geography that gets lost when you say African-American, but a depth and breadth of culture that can get lost. Um, Amanda, tell us who's up next. Uh, looks like Chris and then Molly Newgard. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say relative to your question of like, when does this feel like it was written? I mean, 
if the spirit of it is so much the spirit of 50 years ago, you know, with the Black Panthers and, and you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And I mean, it, this has had to do with um, like, don't minimize the fact that I have a defective heritage. It's like, I have a heritage that I'm proud of and, and, and to affirmatively grab onto it. And I think that's, that's more the cultural moment of 50 years ago than it is now. Except that it, it can't be quite 50 years ago because I feel like African-American as a term right. gained parlance yeah. in the 80s, I want to say. And, and with, you know, with really mixed feelings for some people, it was, um, it was about claiming an American identity and also denoting the specificity of being black in the US. Um, but, and for some people it might've been around distancing from something like the, the Panthers, but it has never, it has never completely subsumed black as a term that um, people claim here and globally. Do not call yeah, me out of my years, name. 50 years ago, it was James Baldwin saying, I am not your Negro, right. but, but that the, the um, other than the specificity of what term is being rejected in it, <laughs> I feel like that's that's its natural time period. Um, is Molly Newgard next? Yes. Um, so to speak to that, I think um, this whole notion of of needing or having to assimilate, but also needing and wanting to retain identity, um, and I think that's I put in the chat. But I think Lois, going back to your question on how do you how do you retain your, your cultural identity or celebrate it in the midst of being a part of the diaspora? And I think this, you know, this poem speaks to that, um, kind of claiming it or reclaiming it when others want to identify you otherwise or call you otherwise or categorize you otherwise. Um, my father immigrated here in the 60s and it was all about in the 70s and 80s assimilating and being as American as you could and and it's regretful now that that was that pressure because trying to retain some of his culture from where he came from, um, but also feeling this intense pressure to, um, to be a part of the quote unquote American way of life and those certain expectations. So I, 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 I hear this poem loud and clear. Yeah, and it's funny, uh, it's discussing a very different poem with uh, some friends of mine who are eighth graders at the Sunnyside K-8 school where they're like all about the social and environmental justice and uh, worldview. And they did not know the word assimilation, which was in one of the poems, that assimilation, which was the great ideal when I was their age of the 1970s is completely like it's so retrograde from their social justice point of view. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And Wendy has put something in the chat about the word grace. Um, we are graces in any places, which she calls a soft word. And it is really literally, aside from that, gee, grace, a very soft in the mouth word. Um, Can I say something? That, sure. Yeah, when I think of grace, I think of spirituality and lightness. And the poem is a very assertive poem, but that sentence just really struck me as this softness and um, it was very different from the rest of the poem. And again, it's a in, it's got internal rhyme, right? So that the, it doesn't rhyme with another line, but it rhymes with itself, which is another uh, tool that poets use when they want to draw your attention to something. And it, I think that was true in um, in the first poem that we looked at, Amanda Gorman's poem. Uh, and that this that line is it's not the only line like this in the poem, but it is its own sentence on a, on a line. So it's one sentence that just occupies one line, but also is in some ways the center point of the poem. It's hard to tell because I've broken this into two columns, but we are graces in any places is sort of the quiet center of the poem. Um, I'm tempted to move us on to look at another photograph unless people feel like there's something else that they have not gotten to in this poem in our cele celebration, I think, of diaspora. Going once, going twice. All right, let's look at another photo. Oh, yeah. 
So I'm going to give you a different assignment with this photograph. Um, we usually are looking at the picture. This time I want you to look as the picture. So take a few moments and choose one of the two figures in this poem and imagine that you are that figure. Really put yourself into the photo. Think about the sensory experiences that you're having and what emotions you might be feeling. So just take a few moments and then we'll have a chance to share our thoughts. Okay, let's start sharing some of what you were imagining in terms of your sensory experiences and your emotions, thinking, looking as the picture rather than just looking at the picture. Who wants to start us off? Kathy has unmuted herself. I wonder if she wants to go first. <laughs> uh, was that me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I, um... I noticed that the child is, she's very comfortable reaching out to the older woman, but the older woman is not reaching back. Okay, okay, I'm gonna stop you. I usually don't stop people when they're talking because I'm gonna force you all to really look as, not just at the picture. So you can be the younger woman or you can be the older woman, but describe it from that perspective. The older woman is happy that the child feels that close to her. I would assume. I mean, I would be if I was that older woman. That's who you're being. That's who you're being. Zemi, I'm going to hand it off to you. Will you tell us about what you're what you're feeling in the picture? Sure, mid mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love this image because um, it makes me think of how it feels to be sitting in the sunlight like this. Um, that is one of my favorite feelings. And, you know, that feeling when you're next to someone, maybe you love, you're just close to someone and the feeling of, you know, touch skin against skin and that warmth as well. So were you imagining yourself particularly as the younger woman, the older woman? Um, probably the older woman just because in my I've always I've had a younger sister and I've been more of the mom or like the caretaker maybe or something yeah oh we've got a cue now um so Poncho and then Madeline and then Chris Rauschenberg and then Molly Major okay so I see myself from the position of the older woman I imagine that they are mother and daughter and I see the daughter um, asleep with a smile on her face and she thinks everything is more or less cool. But from the perspective of the mother, her face is much more concerned and she's worried about what is gonna happen to the future of her daughter. And she doesn't have the same kind of smile on her face that her daughter does. And she knows so much more about what the future is going to involve than her daughter does. And while her daughter can be happy, she is concerned and worried. So I'm gonna push you because I never got to do this with Pancho when he was my boss. Uh, where, is, where do you, I see the absence of smile versus smile, but where do you see the worry in her face? Point, it, point us to it. At, at, at precisely where you just said, the daughter, you can see her teeth. She's, her mouth is open, she's smiling, she's content. 
the mother's mouth is closed. And I think she's she's much more concerned than the daughter is. The daughter thinks life is okay. And the mother is saying to herself, you don't know what kind of shit you're gonna have to deal with. And I do know, and I'm concerned and worried. All right. Uh, I'm gonna reserve further comment until other folks have had a chance to jump in. I can't remember the order of the queue. If you remember where you are in the queue. It was next. So I'm gonna do this first person because I think that's what the intent was. And I am the mother or the grandmother or the older woman. Um, I don't see as much in it as uh, the previous speaker. Okay, so I am tired. I am just exhausted. I have worked hard and this is my time of rest. And I am contained in myself. I have done my work for today. It is my turn to rest. My child is next to me. She is content. I don't even have the energy to reach out to her, but she is next to me and she is safe and she is protected next to me and I can sleep well. My job is done for now. All right, so we've, I love contrasting interpretations. Excellent. Um, <laughs> who's up next? Chris and then Chuck, uh, and then Molly Major and then Chuck Barnes after that. Okay, Chris, Molly, Chuck, thank you. Well, I see myself as a grandmother and I, and I see myself as being um, very self-aware that this is this moment where my granddaughter is still completely comfortable snuggling up to me as if she was a child, even though she's on the cusp of womanhood. Um, and I think of myself as thinking back to when my daughter, her mother, crossed that line where she wasn't going to snuggle up to me so comfortably anymore and thinking, oh, I've lost, I've lost that, that generation of physical closeness and, and I better treasure this moment, which might be my last for this generation. So we have, uh, again, invented narrative, which may or may not be accurate, but I also invited you to do a lot of imagining with this. Um, and I want to um, note before they fly by the, in the chat that somebody commented on the fact that the younger uh, woman is wearing a shirt that says love with a kitten on it, never overlook a cute kitten. Um, and that uh, somebody has said, you know, I think that the older woman may just be less that it's concerned, but she has the lines of a life lived, right? She's older, so she, her, she does not the fresh faced youth uh, that we have on the right. Um, okay, uh, I think, was it Chuck and then Molly or Molly and then Chuck? Molly first. Um, <clears throat> the title is not Nana and Tandy or Tan, whatever. And so that's grandmother. So I imagine myself as the grandmother and I have had this relationship where um, a young, you know, the, my stepson, when he was, I don't know, about eight would climb into bed and um, hold my finger to fall asleep and I would never touch him because this was his gesture to me mm -hmm. that he needed me. And I like what Chris said um, about, you know, this, this isn't gonna last very long. You know, let me just be quiet and, and enjoy this. And when he would do that, just love would flow into my heart. Yeah. So, I don't think that needs to be expressed on her face. Um, no, anyway. All right, I have some, I'm putting myself online after Chuck Barnes. I think in the same vein as other people, I, I, uh, I identify with the older person. And in, in this one, I'm, I'm the grandmother. I don't know if I'm tired. I'm taking a moment out of the day to not sit on furniture and come to the child's level. We're getting out the pillows and my back hurts a little bit because I'm <laughs> older. So I'm putting a pillow under my back and we're on the carpet and we're kind of playing together and taking this moment. And I might be tired, I might be worried about the world, but this for, for me is the moment about just creating this space where we can both have this moment of joy together. Yeah, and I think I, I want to connect that back to what Zemi said at the start about that, that 
pleasurable, what for many of us is the pleasurable feeling of uh, lying in the sun. Um, and I'm also thinking about the, the, the postures of these two women's bodies, right? The older woman has her one arm across her belly and the younger woman is sort of approximating this gesture, right? So they're not a straight mirror image, um, but I feel like the younger woman is approximating the older woman in a way that to me underscores a sense of connection that it is her hand that's reaching out to the older woman, but it's reaching out in a way that is entwining their two other arms. That um, the fact that her head covering is similar in color to the older woman's shirt is another point of connection, physical or visual connection between the two of them that I find really interesting. Um, I am surprised that nobody has said anything yet about, there's a, a line which presumably is the shadow from the um, window frame, frame is my, maybe not the right word, architects can correct me about what that part of the window is called, uh, that falls across the younger woman's face. And it even divides her face in a little bit because of how the light and shadow is working. And I'm interested if, if anybody noticed that and if so, what you noticed about it. Um, and I see that uh, Marvin's got a hand up. So uh, Marvin, tell us what you were thinking about. Yes, it would help if I unmute. Um, I am the grandmother. Uh, I am asleep. The touch of my granddaughter's skin against my skin has released the tension I have felt and my face is completely at rest. Yeah, which is another way to read that that mouth too, right? That there is no tension in that face. Um, not necessarily, it could be worry or it could be the relief of worry. And we don't know the answer to that. The, the photo is only telling us so much. Um, you know, it looks like Poncho's hand is raised now. And, and Christopher also asked, Chris asked whether anybody saw themselves as the younger figure. So feel free to uh, put yourself in line or put something in the chat if you did, Poncho. So I think about the economics of this pose. Um, here is the grandmother and her granddaughter, and they're in the same bed. The granddaughter is not five years old, and the grandmother is like soothing her before she goes to sleep. It looks like she, the, the younger one, is at least a teenager. And so that raises to me the question of what is the economics of their situation? Are they in poverty and thus they are forced to sleep in the same bed even when you wouldn't expect that to be a necessary situation? But because of their economic situation, it is a necessity. So one of the clues for me here is that the, um, the older woman has on a silver bracelet. She also has earrings, they're a little harder to see and we can't see the younger woman's ears. We can't even see her other wrists, but she's wearing a silver bracelet, which tells me something. She's wearing earrings, she tells me something, which tells me something. I don't, I do not know enough about fine rugs to be able to read the carpet that they're on. And I'm also curious about that carpet um, on the floor. Like I was thinking about uh, worshiping on carpet um, as Muslims do. I was thinking about as um, Chuck observed earlier, this is a, this is, they're not on furniture. They've chosen carpet on the floor as their space. So does that mean that this is uh, necessity and a lack of furniture or is this about stealing a nap together it maybe this is if we for all the narratives that we might create maybe they are visiting someplace that they don't normally live or at least one of them is visiting and so they are uh camped out as it were but not necessarily in a way that is about long-term deprivation but just about more bodies than usual that are in this house um and when somebody said something about the younger girl has more of her hand on her belly than her arm on the belly. And we often associate that 
with pregnancy, although she could also just be an asleep person. Um, other thoughts about this one? Not at the moment. I hope you enjoyed me torturing you about looking as the picture rather than just looking at the picture. I have to say, um, it is an incredibly enjoyable thing to do, especially if you're looking at uh, photographs with kids, usually because kids are more willing to do this than grownups. We're all terribly stuck in ourselves as grownups, is to have uh, people actually take on the poses in photographs. It's really fascinating because it, because you do see, as it were, more in the photograph once you start putting yourself in physical positions about what feels like closeness, what feels like distance, um, what is it, you know, is the, is the love on the shirt telling us how to read the interaction between these two people in a way that then their physical bodies is reinforcing. Um, Any other thoughts before we go on? And do we have time to go on to one more photograph or should we stop now? Molly, tell us what to do. Sure, one more, okay. And like, if you need to leave, go leave, it's okay. She says one second. Maybe that was one more. Okay, one more. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, so, this is a different photograph. And if you know the title, hold back from answering because uh, it's a long complicated title that I specifically did not put on the slide. So hold back from answering if you know the title. But if you just look at this picture, what is this a picture of? Our other images definitely had uh, human, humans in them. What is this a picture of? Let's hear from Poncho first. So I noticed two things. I noticed all the flowers. Um, for me, most interesting is to the left of the flowers on the table, there's a photograph of someone. Uh, I can't quite see, it looks like in like a cap and gown. Yeah. Um, so that raises two possibilities for me, uh, one positive and one negative. The positive one is the person in the photograph has just graduated from either high school or college and there's a party going on to celebrate her and that's why all the flowers are there. On the other hand, uh, she has died and this is a memorial service for her and the photograph is up there for people to remember her. And I will say it may be hard to see depending on how big your device is. The, the person in that photograph is young, right? So this is one of those instances in which we're showing how much we love education by putting in cap and gowns, kids who are not graduating from college, not graduating from high school, this kid looks maybe elementary school and maybe even younger. And it's hard for me to see it. I haven't seen the photo in person. Um, and you're also assuming um, a relationship between the flowers and the photograph. That is to say that the, that the photograph is there because the flowers are there or the flowers are there for the person in the photograph. Yes, I am assuming right, that. Right. Uh, looks like Marvin also has a hand up. You have to unmute yourself, please Marvin. There's something hidden in this picture. There's a photo, there's a picture sitting on the ground, partially covered by the flower pot and the curtain. And I can't see what that is. Um, but why is that taken down and hidden? And um, what if if we could tell what's a picture of, but I just just can't. There's not enough of it. And I'm just curious, is, is anyone thought of the significance of that? Why, why does there have to be, and this is gorgeous colors, nice decoration. Um, it shows part of the furniture in the room, um, but it's also hiding something. Why is it hiding something? 
That is superb. I have looked at this picture so much and never noticed that there is a hidden picture in the picture. Thank you for that. So, and I want to also um, connect what you just said back to one of the comments that came up in the chat about the color that is suffusing this picture, right? So we have the red of the curtains, which picks up the red in the collar on the um, person in the cap and gown photo, the sort of reddish brown of the, what looks like the edge of a piece of upholstered furniture, I'm guessing on the very right side of the frame, but of course the um, bursts of red and white and yellow and purple and green that are in the um, floral arrangement. And all of that color kept me from seeing what you drew our attention to, which is this photograph. I think it's probably a photograph um, that it seems to have been displaced from somewhere and set on the floor with the flowers in front of it. Um, and the flowers seem to be of an occasion, even if we don't know what the occasion is. That's more than just, I brought something in from the garden today, right? There's, that's an expanse. Um, but that, and I want to say, it brings us back to the first image. I could pretend that I was smart and did this on purpose, but I, I didn't. Um, because it looks like there, like there's some maybe sea uh, or water fowl or sea life or something going in or out of a body of water. Because I can see the ripples of the water in that hidden photograph, but have no idea really what's there. And that it's the lines of the frame echo, I think somebody may have called this out in the chat, the um, oil cloth or whatever that covering is, the tablecloth covering on the, on the side of the frame. Yeah. Um, Molly, do you, did you want to say something? Yeah, so I'm, th I'm thinking about it as a photograph, uh, um, the composition of it and the choices the photographer made in, in terms of the cropping. Um, of the scene because the focal point, so to speak, is, is this display of flowers, but everything surrounding it, these tiny little details of which we get partial little, you know, little tidbits are what draw, that we're drawn to. And then of course, like at the, uh, the bottom third of the photograph that is just, is this open space. So I think it's, it's an interesting choice that, you know, where is our eye drawn? Because the focal point, the flowers are, are interesting, but it's, it's the framing and the, and the cropping of objects of which we have to sort of guess or assume what they are to kind of construct this space itself. So as a photograph, I find it's really, it's really interesting. Yeah, and I, it never feels to me like the, there's something, something about, about, the, about the flower center of the frame or maybe it's because they don't feel like they're quite exactly in focus to me or something that doesn't make me feel like this is a picture of this beautiful floral arrangement that just happens to have edges of the room in it that is not that is not how I would describe this photograph um, other thoughts about the photograph Marvin, did you want to chime in again? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just interesting. All these gorgeous colors, um, and um, it's arranged. I have a feeling that those blinds might be up most of the time during the day, and that flower pot is for the florist. It's not something you put flowers in when you bring them home and put them. And so um, everything has been put here for a purpose, which I don't know for sure, except it's artificial. Uh, you don't put flowers on the pot, typically against a window with the braids. I, I just, I'm, I, I don't want to start babbling. I just don't, I, these things are puzzling to me and I don't have answers. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely more puzzling than clear cut. I will, I will second that emotion. And I think that part of what you're saying and saying, like it's weird that they're on the floor when it's clear that other things are on tables. Like why are they on the floor? It, they don't quite seem even to really fit in between the table and what Lois has in, 
uh, interpreted as upholstered furniture. Um, it feels like they're a little bit squashed on one side. So that um, this is the opposite of, I think as Molly was saying, there's something very thoughtful in the composition of the photograph, but it is not trying to make um, a pristine or precise scene of daily living. Uh, looks like Madeline has her hand up. Mute. Um, I think this photograph is a sophisticated photograph trying to be a snap, you know, trying to look like a snapshot. So I think it's really got that snapshot kind of quality, but there's too many questions. It's like, okay, we're going to throw the flowers there. We just came home from a thing and they had all these flowers and we took it off the big dais because nobody else did or whatever. Um, but it yeah. begs the question, who lives here? Whose home is this? Where they have this great red lacy window stuff in this brown plaid oil cloth or plastic covered tablecloth that's on a table that's cluttered with whatever. Um, and then this burgundy upholstered furniture and this framed thing hanging on the, sitting on the floor. And who are these people? And as I said, it's a photograph pretending to be a snapshot. Yeah, I like that idea that it is, um, it is not casual, it is composed, but it is not, but it wants to mislead us into thinking that it's casual. And, and the more I look at that table, the, I'm wondering if the thing next to the cap and gown photo is maybe either framed or maybe just propped up um, like a inspirational message or a card or something like that. I can't quite tell. And I've not seen this one in the gallery. So I don't know if um, Blue Sky folks who've been in the gallery with it have, could say more of having looked at it up close. No. Um, and Molly put in the chat, there is a disarray that is intriguing by how unexceptional the items are. <laughs> I think that's it exactly. Um, and I will now reveal absolutely nothing by telling you the title of the photograph. Um, it's long and I should say that um, Woodleen Cadet who took this photograph is from Haiti. She lives in the US now and I'm not reading the title in the original but in translation, but the title translates as these are the first curtains you've brought, you, pardon me, these are the first curtains you've bought that I've liked, comma, nothing can be seen from outside. Let me just read that again. <laughs> these are the first curtains you've bought that I've liked, comma, nothing can be seen from outside. As I told you, it reveals so much and yet absolutely nothing about the meaning of the photograph, right? Except to me at least, uh, it's heightening this question of like exterior and interior. If, if the thing that I like about these curtains is that it doesn't let people on the outside see what's going on on the inside, what does it mean that we are looking at a photograph of what's on the inside? Madeline, would you like to chime in next? I don't know if Madeline was. Uh, uh, no, I think it's just, <laughs> again, begging that question of, yeah, we're on the inside, but we still don't know anything. And, and that we're on the inside of a space that somebody does not want people looking into. <laughs> right, and it doesn't give us, you know, we get an, I feel as if it's almost, you know, the church lady from Saturday Night Live of the 70s. It's just this weird sort of, almost a stereotypic view also of a character. I think that it's, that it maybe feels a little bit, I don't know if kitschy is quite the right word, but the, um, the kind of blandness of the color of the wall, looks like one wall is white um, and one wall is this kind of bland peachy color. And the, the plaid tablecloth is also kind of bland. And then there are these other bursts of color, but even having the um, graduation photo is a little cliche, right? Um, that maybe it's as much cliche as 
more than that than Kitch. It looks like Chris is waiting and then Marvin wants to circle back. I was just going to answer your question of what is what is that thing that appears to be a, a plaque just to the left of the uh, oh yeah single digit age person's graduation picture. It <laughs> says, as you graduate, an ending of one chapter and the beginning of another, a new and exciting adventure awaits you today. You do not know all the paths you will take and then there's some rocks hiding the rest of it. Good zooming in, or you have a very large screen, <laughs> which I also, somebody alluded to earlier, like taking the flowers off the dais, which I feel like that's the only reason my mother ever goes anywhere is that you can take the flowers at the end of the reception. <laughs> so I like the idea that that actually does tie the flowers to the photograph in some way and, and in a way that is maybe more celebratory than we might, um, there might be other reasons for flowers to be. Uh, Marvin, what were you gonna say? That white line on the right side of the picture is a door frame. It's not another wall. Mm. See, it's the same color as the baseboard. Okay. And you I know, like if I... you're, th this, your mother came home from this graduation party with these flowers. Yeah. Maybe that, that's, what, that's what's being shown off. But still, our title, these are the first curtains you've bought that I've liked. Nothing can be seen from outside. It is not the day Jeremiah graduated from kindergarten or, you know, whatever. Um, that is to say, the flowers, the graduation photo, the card, or the whatever that is about the graduation suggest a moment. Whereas the title suggests kind of an ongoing relationship to the space that I'm also fascinated by. You have bought other curtains that I didn't like. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you sure have. <laughs> <laughs> which is also- Anything that you bought. Which is also really funny because like, if you were gonna like these curtains, you're, you would think that you are liking these curtains because of their fantastic shimmering color. Now, some people might not like the curtains for exactly that reason, but you would think that the like or not like of these curtains would be about the color. But no, it's about their opacity and particularly about their ability to block exactly. the, vision, exactly. the vision into the space that we're looking at. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we have, as usual, had a very fascinating but long ranging conversation and does anybody have anything else that they are bursting to share? I think Eric, I think Evan is taking our picture. Is that legal? <laughs> screenshot. Oh, that was a screenshot. It was a <laughs> um, any final thoughts? All right. Well, I think uh, Molly will probably let us do this all again next month. Yes, I would just like to say, I didn't have a chance to say this in the beginning, but Lois, you, you mentioned that we allow you to come and do this. No, we are, we are privileged to have you come and do this. So thank you so much for the past many months. Um, and if it weren't for the pandemic, we, we might not have thought about doing this. So thank you. And we will continue, no, you know, no matter what I think I would like to. So hopefully, yeah, next month, count on it and stay tuned. So don't tell Molly New Guard, but I was going to keep. I was going to do this even without a pandemic. I love yeah. this. So uh, one yeah. one day back in the gallery, but until then, continuing That's right. like this. All right. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thanks. Don't do that, Lois. I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm trying to unscrew share my screen. <laughs>